Up next is Dr. Ed Beebe. Does everybody here know Dr. Ed Beebe? Everybody loves Ed. Well, I know everybody loves Ed, but does he know how accomplished this, this gentleman is as a part of our society? I'm going to tell you. Um, also, his presentation of routine clinical utilization of hypnotic process for habit control with emphasis on the lucrative methods for smoking cessation, or Brother Kenyon's paradigm, or paradigm. <laughs> Paradigm's okay. Paradigm. I always say East Coast, maybe I, Chicago. That's, that's where it comes from. I, I yeah. have what, to paradigm? say paradigm first before I say paradigm. It's Terrific, Katie. <laughs> You're welcome. Incidentally, just how do you interrupt an introduction? That brother, well, it's your introduction. Brother Kenya Paradigm is the creation of the powerful mind of Dave Harrod. He comes up with these wild, off the wall things. And uh, I just oh, I really like want it. to give him credit. I probably should have put a footnote. <laughs> well, thank you, David. Appreciate it. In 1975, Dr. Edgar A. Barrett, MD, wrote the description sure. of the actual process of hypnosis boils down to just four words. This despite the fact that no one knows exactly what hypnosis is. Dr. Barrett's view helps our hypnotic clients to understand not what hypnosis is, but how it works. In my view, this greatly facilitates primary and subsequent hypnotic inductive process. It also assists our clients in learning uh, self-hypnosis. Tobacco smoking is a filthy, disgusting habit. Really. <laughs> Will you go over that again for those of us? <laughs> in bold letters, which is very harmful to smokers, as well as to those exposed to the poisonous chemicals, which compromise, hey, it was capitalized, I had to, uh, environmental secondary and tertiary smoke. Let's review and discuss how best to assist our clients in the process of stop smoking now. Attendees will learn the importance of BB's cholerary and Barrett's hypotheses. It can be argued that one of the four words is incorrect, or at least partially so. Okay, so Ed's bio here is Ed Baby has been interested in the phenomenon of hypnosis since his teenage years in the 1950s when books on the subject were hard to find for a high school student. He did, however, obtain a 33 and one third RPM recording on hypnosis sold by mail order by a Dr. Ag Abraham Zayden, is that his name? Zayden? Yeah. Dr. Uh, a suggested on the record, uh, on the record, that one could become hypnotized by simply allowing oneself to feel very, very drowsy. The instructions with the record recommended listening to the first side ten times before starting to listen to the second side. This became so boring he never forgot the other side. From time to time, however, he found his body pieces of information on the subject and was able to determine that people could be hypnotized into a state of receptivity to suggestions by the presentation of appropriate metaphoric material. So, uh, one happy spring afternoon in 1965, he invited a girlfriend over to his apartment on 2nd Street, east of the University of Arizona campus in Tucson. Her response to metaphoric hypnotic presentation was quite surprising. He learned a fascinating lesson from this, which he will share with us at his talk for the ASTH meeting tonight. You can save some time if you wish, because what you're reading yes. uh, is on the handout and is also in the uh, thing. But it isn't. It's great to sit here and hear great things about it. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> you have a page on here. Last one here, 67, Bachelor of Arts in Science, Chemistry and Psychology, University of uh, Arizona, Tucson, 67 and 92, a quarter century research, uh, chemistry and hospital clinical work as a lab director, from 91 to 92, trained with two physicians in Tucson, completed the National Field Hypnosis Course, uh, 90, 1992, and she was certified. 97, and a certified instructor, 97, uh, 2001, top five years <coughs> NGH certification courses in Tucson, Arizona, 99, uh, basic board certification in hypnosis, 2000, an alternative doctorate in clinical hypnotherapy, um, which is, that's a good one, we would all like that one. Uh, 2002, he got the NGH uh, Member of the Year Award, 
NGH Fellow in 2003 and 07. Uh, he is the order of the great late NGH, Lifetime Hypnosis Achievement Award. Wolf. Summing it up, and from 2002 to 2016, publication of 54 quarterly articles accepted by the Journal of Hypnosis and in 05 and 2015, presentation of 20 hypnosis lectures to senior psychiatrists, a psychiatrist, psychiatric, it's the resident physicians in Tucson, and finally, but last, but I'm sure, but not least, from 93 to uh, 2016, over 20 full time uh, office practice of professional consulting hypnotist in Tucson, Dr. Ed B. Actually, I need a lot of help, and I thank you very much thank for Thank you. Enthusiastic. Okay. How many of you here will admit to being over the age of 60? Well, we have some. Yeah, how many over the age of 70? 75? What? No one is over the age of 75. I won't admit to it. <laughs> well, <laughs> that might make me the oldest person in the room. And if I'm in a, a good spot here, my tie is straight, you can hear me. What we have heard about, you do not have to look at now. It is. Uh, copy of two papers I wrote for the uh, National Guild of Hypnotists in the last couple of years. Uh, I published mm -hmm. 54, right? That's, yes, uh, boy, is. that's a lot of publications. And I'm a legend in my own mind. Uh -huh. And I enjoy hypnotizing very much. And I detest cigarette smoke. The reason is that both my parents died from smoking. My dad was a patent attorney in New York in the midtown Manhattan working for a chemical firm. Mm -hmm. And he and the people on his staff were in the penthouse and so all the fumes from the central research labs came up into the patent office. Mm -hmm. And they're in midtown Manhattan. And they smoked a couple of packs of Chesterfield or Philip Morris every day and hey, who knew? His father was a doctor in Buffalo, New York. He smoked. My mother's father was a uh, salesman really. <laughs> He sold conveyor belts to a man named Henry Ford in uh, Detroit, and he smoked. My dad died at 53, and my mother died at 83. And on each case, in each case, the death certificate read cause of death, smoking, or kidney failure, renal impairment, <coughs> emphysema due to smoking. So there isn't a lot of love lost between me <laughs> And these cigarette manufacturers that have taken quite a few years off of my father's life and my mother's. And as it turns out, my hippie sister was very bright. She has a degree in math uh, from Redlands, and she uh, lived, lived the cleanest life I can ever imagine, all nuts and twigs and way up north in New Mexico. <laughs> she died at 70 from a... Uh, about a five centimeter uh, tumor in her pancreas. And it was really disseminated CA. She also had it in the back of her head, just underneath the cerebellum, and in her leg, and in her spine. By chance, her son and daughter in law are both practicing physicians. So they were able to at least get into the surgical conferences when she was done. But she never smoked. You're mm -hmm. like, oh, what happened? Well, she grew up in a smoking household, as did I, and I have chronic bronchitis because of it. So I'm really displeased with the cigarette manufacturers. Last page on the handout, and I know that many of you are Democrats and are looking for handouts. Um, <laughs> <let's>, <laughs> that's a cheap shot. Yeah. If you cut the left wing off the American Eagle, he will only fly in circles. Let's understand that there are some people here who, like me, served overseas at great risk of life in order to let you vote for crazy people. Anyway, uh, on the uh, 
last page there is a very useful thing if you work with smoking clients. How many here work with people to stop their smoking habit? Two, three, four, two. How many would like to if it paid better? <laughs> it pays fairly well, remember. Because you can charge 300 bucks an hour to take somebody off smoking if you want to. And you might see them four, five, six times. So you could say gross uh, $1,500, $1,800 per client. And you think, well, it's not a lot of money for just talking to somebody. But you're not just talking to them. And if they're, say, 30, 35 years of age, and you're getting them off of this grotesquely noxious habit, prevents them from smoking for another 30 years, and the cost of smoking per year, by the way, how much is that? I mean, let's say smoke a pack a day. $2,500 yeah, a year. $2,500 a year per pack. Now, I'm over 75, so when I was a kid, a pack of cigarettes was 20 cents. They were a penny <coughs> cigarette. Uh, they've gone up somewhat since then. And when you work with clients, it doesn't hurt to point out that not only is it expensive now, but it's going way up, um, maybe at 8% a year. Now, my mother's mother and my mother's grandmother were two wonderful ladies from Detroit who kept two really bad habits out of their lives. Neither of them smoked cigarettes and neither of them operated motor vehicles. Because back in the 1880s and 1910s and so forth, the men drove the cars and there weren't that many cars around. Well, if you don't smoke and you don't drive, you're inclined to live longer. Both of them lived to 100. So I, there, there is more than enough evidence that this habit is terrible. When you hypnotize someone to stop a habit, you're essentially providing them with greater self-control. And you're helping their subconscious mind understand or recognize that they do have the power to make change in their lives and they can avoid this thing that they've otherwise been attracted to. One of the things that really stands out is the fact that cigarette smoke contains all kinds of poisons. And chemically, there may be as many as 7,000 different things that you can identify, like gas chromatography or mass spectrographic work uh, in cigarette smoke. Uh, the poisons are just endless. However, here's a nice little list. And this list, go. Yes. Do they put the bird droppings in on purpose, or is that left over on the tobacco <laughs> from the field? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes it's actually, it's not on the uh, ingredients on the pack. Yeah. However, you've pointed out an important part of the list. You see. And for those of you who are not entirely offended by, by Anglo-Saxon four-letter words, it's really bird shit. And it's also bat shit. And it really is in tobacco because it's a weed. And so when the weed is growing, there are birds flying over it and crapping on it. And when they shred it up and they they put it on pallets and bars when they cure it before shred shredding. There are bats in the barns. So there's bat crap on tobacco also. So when you set fire to a little tube of tobacco that's been shredded up, you're setting fire to all kinds of stuff that you really don't want to take into your body. But people do it. You know, it's debonair, it's, debonair, it's uh, charming, it's elegant, it feels good, it helps relax you, and it fills your lungs with poison. And you think, well, uh, I'm in pretty good shape. I work out, my lungs are okay. Well, fine. But because there are so many chemicals. 26. 26? There are 26 chemicals in, in a cigarette. cigarette smoke. Mm -hmm. You must be smoking very clean cigarettes. <laughs> And do you make the distinction yeah. mm -hmm. when you have somebody who's a tobacco chewer versus a smoker? <coughs> As of me now, I've had a few people, I've worked with chewers, they quit, I've helped them. I have a chewer right now I'm working with. Do you make a distinction when you work with them do the same stuff? Do you actually see them chew it, uh, Dr. Heller? No, he chews it, look how hard it is now, chews it three times a day. I'm down to Do you see day. him chew it? Or does he just take a lot of it, stick it between his chicken and his cheek and his, and his gum? Yeah. So he isn't really chewing it, is he? No, he's 
<laughs> yeah, no, they just call it chewing tobacco. Yeah. Or they call it smokeless tobacco. That would be safer, wouldn't it? Oh, of course, you don't set fire to it. But I think he actually is chewing it. I, I actually is, it. is he possibly a, uh, a motorcycle cop? Um, no. Oh, gee. Because they're fun. I have it when he was in high school with the, with the baseball team, yeah. and they all, you know, they, they all chewed. Good day now. Yeah. <sighs> I'm playing with my box. I mean, I mean, you see the, all this distinction between putting it in just as a wad versus chewing mm -hmm. the smoke. They don't it's chew it. They stick it between their gum and their cheek, and they suck on the okay. juice. Whatever's juice. coming out of the juice. Yeah. 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 There's a significant yeah. amount of nicotine in there. So Why? Dr. Good Dr. Like, I'd like to go back to this for a second. Um, Certainly. Dr. B began in a list a few years ago. I used a similar one to that, but, mm -hmm. but I've kept all those chemicals on there, including the bird and bat droppings. And, and, I, and I read through that with my clients, and it's interesting. I ask them after I get through the list, and on there is hexamine, there's uh, formaldehyde, cyanide, uh, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, monoxide, monoxide on there, and, and mm -hmm. all those things, and formaldehyde, all those things, you know, and I tell them formaldehyde, that's why they preserve dead bodies in. It sounds appealing, <laughs> doesn't it? And then um, cyanide, deadly poison, just a, just a drop will kill you. And then I tell, I tell them about the bird and the bat droppings. And I ask them which one really makes them the sickest. And they always say the bird and the bat droppings. <laughs> yeah, and then I go back and remind them, oh, wait a minute, though, these other things are much more dangerous. So it's interesting what people perceive as dangerous and horrible. But it's a great list, though. If you're not using this, use it. It's a fly, it's a gift. This has worked incredibly well. What you're doing when you do this is when the patient is in a plenary state of hypnosis. They're essentially somnambulistic. They're deeply relaxed. They're highly receptive to anything you say. And so you kind of read down through a few of the poisons contained in tobacco smoke, formaldehyde, acetone, arsenic, polonium, carbon monoxide, vinyl chloride, urethane, cyanide, chloroform, Cadmium, pesticides, bird shit, beryllium, lead, zinc, <laughs> copper, hexamine, <laughs> nitrous oxide, phenyl. See, in soil, there are metallic ions of elements. Polonium's the nastiest because it's uh, radioactive. Polonium 210 is what the Russians kill people with. They'll put a quick color of that somewhere, perhaps in your gastrocnemius or some other spot you don't want it. And you'll be very sick and very, very dead within about five days, as you may have heard if you've looked into that. Um, carbon monoxide is interesting because, uh, contrary to uh, what you might imagine, cigarettes are not on fire. Matches are on fire. Lighters are on fire. Cigarettes glow. It's, it's incomplete combustion. You have this warm glow at the tip of the smoke and as the cigarette, and as you inhale, you're inhaling carbon monoxide due to incomplete combustion. Now, all of you who have been to medical school know exactly how the circulating reefron works. You have, oh boy, 21 trillion red blood cells in your body, and each one of them has got a whole bunch of heme porphyrin in it. And that heme porphyrin can pick up <coughs> gas molecules and release them. And it's kind of like a thermos bottle. You know, it keeps hot things hot and cold things hot. But how do you know? If it keeps hot things hot and cold things cold, how does it know? Well, in the case of the heme porphyrin, and I can see several doctors are thinking, oh, where did he learn this stuff? I, I think it was on the <laughs> um, Now, I put my ex-wife through medical school and I have to attend a lot of classes. It's amazing what you can learn just sitting there. Um, each red blood cell, which is seven microns in diameter, is floating around by the quintillion billions in your bloodstream. And when they get to the capillaries, instead of looking like little donuts, they stretch out like little hot dogs. So that there's greater surface area on the cell membrane. And there's gas exchange. And what it does is if it's in the lungs, it dumps carbon dioxide and it picks up oxygen. If it's out in the tissue, it dumps the oxygen and picks up carbon dioxide. And you're like, oh, how do it know? Well, it knows because carbon dioxide is an acid anhydride. 
it has a slightly lower pH when dissolved in water than other chemicals that might be in there. And it's only slightly lower. But because of that, the cell knows that it will dump oxygen where the pH is low because the, the uh, tissues are dumping carbon dioxide. And it, the reverse occurs in the lung. And this happens a billion times a second in your life, in your body. All the time it's going on, keeping you alive and keeping you warm. <laughs> because you have to have the oxygen to make the mitochondria happy. And most of you know about intermediary metabolism. <laughs> and some smiles there. A couple of dots on Yeah, we had that. Gosh, it was back in black chemistry. I knew a nurse one time who had a master's degree in nursing. She knew a lot of stuff. And uh, she was almost, almost expressing how much she knew. And uh, she was kind of a leader at the hospital. Uh, she saw to it that other stuff got done. And if anything went wrong, boy, she'd be right out of the spot. Uh, she would uh, take stuff from the ER, maybe a wheelchair or something, and bring it up to a patient's room. Or she had all this stuff. She was putting out fire. She was fixing things. I called her the put nurse because she was always taking stuff out of one place and putting it in another. And we'd get into discussions about, about biochemistry or pharmacology or whatever. And one time she said, well, you don't realize what it's like in advanced nursing. We have to study intermedullary materialism. I said, what? We have to study intermedullary materialism. It's really advanced stuff. You probably haven't had that. Chances are I haven't. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I may have this out on that one. Anyway, your system can't stand having carbon monoxide in it to any large extent because it's not an acid anhydride. It doesn't change the pH of the blood. <coughs> so once a carbon monoxide molecule gets picked up by the heme porphyrin, it's there forever. It kills that one little part of that one cell. And if you're exposed to a lot of carbon monoxide, well, as you well know, uh, it can slow you down permanently. My ex-wife was in medical school in 1970, 70, 71. She had a uh, classmate who was a really sharp kid. He knew his stuff, but unlike all the rest of us who were trying to get into med school who studied physiology and biochemistry, he studied literature and psychology and things that were of interest to him. And he got straight A's and he got into med school. But when he got there, he was just overwhelmed by how much he had to learn. And so, second semester, first year, he took the new car that his family had given him and drove it out in a cornfield, hooked the vacuum cleaner hose up to the uh, exhaust pipe, stuck it in the front, went to sleep, and we haven't heard from him since. It's sad, when we, we lose one medical school class per year due to physician suicide, but most of them are not the first year of med school. Anyway. There are various substances that poison mitochondria, and when that happens, <coughs> you're in very serious trouble, and it's impossible to fix yourself on your own. So, the poisons that are in the cigarette smoke don't quite kill you. Because if they did, you wouldn't come back to buy more. People go around, this is a, uh, about 36 times 2, gee, yeah, 60 or 70, uh, Big lighters. They're wonderful. Almost any of these will probably still work. Too. I don't know if I could try it. If it was a Ronson, it would light. <laughs> <laughs> About 49 a piece. I had, this is my small basket. I yes, it is. <laughs> you, you've that. seen the big basket. It's just huge. Well, but I've been hypnotizing people for 20 years, and they tend to break their lighters. And in the old days, they bring these wonderful Ronson lighters. And those are 75 bucks a piece. This one will spark, but probably not light. Yeah, there he goes. And then my favorite lighter. You may have to scan in close. <laughs> this is a hand grenade. <laughs> it even has a little ring on it. And you can make it do it. This, the gas is all gone from it. Uh, but it does remind people that what you're doing is genuinely dangerous. 
people come in and they say, I just can't stop smoking, which is not a very good thing to say to yourself because your subconscious mind hears everything you say. Various things up here. What I've done here in this black box is bring a bunch of stuff that's nice to have in your lab and one or two are in your office and one or two things you probably shouldn't. For example, this is a nursing stethoscope. Five bucks online. And they're fun too. You can really care neat stuff with these. But the National Guild of Hypnotists says, don't do that. If you are, am I still connected here? Yeah. Um, if, if you're a hypnotist, don't walk around with a stethoscope around your neck and taking on the trappings of another profession. Um, although, a lot of us worked in hospitals and learned how to take blood pressures. And that's awfully difficult to do without this. Or really, the new ones. I have a spray right before I put it in and out today. Um, we have some other choice for stuff. The worst, of course, is this thing. Anybody know what that is? I hope. Ever seen one of these before? Yeah. What do you think that is? Oh, that's a vapor. This is a nicotine vapor inhaler. They're quite expensive. One of the things you do with smokers, you say, is uh, get them to get rid of their paraphernalia. I even say to them on the phone, you're going to stop and bring your stuff with me, with you, bring it to me. I collect smoking paraphernalia. For example, This, say again? You would have an eBay you make a fortune. Uh, well, this one I would. Well, this is solid sterling silver, which is 92.5, and probably six or eight ounces. Well, I have anyone of any degree of sophistication realizes that that is a candy dish. But the gal that brought her in was using it as a cigarette <coughs> ashtray. Uh, she turned it in. Well, I've kept it around as my favorite ashtray for years. Most of us, what you carry your cigarettes in and what you light it with, those are the things that keep reminding you. Yeah. yeah. Over the years, I picked up an awful lot. Well, probably, what, 20 of these? In the yeah. yeah uh, I've got one. They, they, don't, they don't really sell very many of them anymore. They're, they're expensive. And, but they, growing up in Long Island, New York, everybody had one of these sure. on their coffee table. And then, come to the work in hypnosis done by Sigmund Freud, who some people think may not have learned to do it as well as we do. Uh, occasionally, he would hypnotize people, and they would go very deep, whatever that means. And I think we could even figure out sort of what it means. But um, they wouldn't come back out when he gave them general suggestions to return to normal waking. And to fix this, this man who ultimately died of jaw cancer, and cancer of the salt palate too, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. He was a sick man by the 40s. He, uh, he would go over to the patient, lean over them, and I won't do this to any, but he'd blow right on the bridge of their nose. He's poof! And the guy had abominable breath, because <laughs> he smoked cigars. Well, I, when I started doing this, I thought, well, I'm not going to go over and blow people's faces if they go too deep. So I came up with this wonderful little syringe. And it makes kind of a neat sound. And if somebody goes too deep, you just go over and... The thing is, though, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've never used it, other than the fact that I keep it just in case I might have to. And fixation objects are helpful. You can have your client look at something and ideally hold it above eye level so that their eyes roll up. How many of you work with eye roll or use eye roll as hands? Uh, when you see all these rolling eyes, where'd you learn that? Where is it in the literature? <laughs> yeah, I'll show you. <coughs> Answering my own question. Okay. <laughs> 1978. Dr. David Spiegel and his son, pardon, 
Dr. Herbert Spiegel and his son, David Spiegel. Both MDs, both from New York, Owen Davis now at uh, Stanford. These are brilliant MD hypnotists, and they published a book in the 70s that they call Transcend Treatment. And it is unbelievably convoluted. <laughs> and it has far more information in it than you could ever want, especially if you're just hypnotizing. But it did have some very nice little pictures of eyes rolling. <laughs> And they posited at that time that if when you ask a client, in their case a patient, to roll their eyes up, if they don't roll up, they are exhibiting low receptivity to dissociative phenomena. They're not going to be that easy to hypnotize. If on the other hand they roll way up, you should be able to just snap them into hypnosis. And at the time in 78, that kind of held sway, but then people said, oh, no, just a minute. So, I don't know, Lou, have you experienced it one way or the other? You, no, at least, I don't know this correlation. You know, it's, it's curious. Um, I use it, and the reason I wrote the book is simply because in these two cases that I have printed up here, in each case, I would say to them on the way in, just lie back, relax, and with the eyes open, roll your eyes up as if you were looking through the top of your head. And once you've done that, gently close the eyelids, take a deep breath, hold it, gently breathe out, and just go deeper into stillness, simply by letting go. Some people really react quite strongly to that. It's, Mike. What I found, and we've had this conversation before, is that um, my, the correlation I found is that people that do roll their eyes back um, are good. always make great subjects. Yes. But people that do not roll their eyes back, it doesn't mean that they won't make great subjects. Exactly. There's no solid evidence of it. No. But I will tell you, from a stage show perspective, every now and then, um, I will see a client or a, a volunteer roll their eyes back, and they are almost always the best subject on stage. You mentioned um, why is that the case? You're an MD. You ever see an episode of syncope in any clinical circumstance? Ever see somebody faint? Yeah. I've seen people with seizures <laughs> that their eyes roll back. Oh man, do they? Uh, it just, they and I think that's where the people's guys. But if you happen to witness, after when somebody faints, uh, you're not necessarily standing in front of them watching their eyes when they do it. But if you're doing a lot of clinical work, you'll see it from time to time. And what happens is the eyes roll, and then they just collapse. They, they, uh, the muscles let go, all the striated musculature just loses its, its capacity to hold you up. Uh, and you fall down, and it's beneficial, because then your heart is <laughs> horizontal with your brain. It doesn't have to pump up through the uh, carotids. Well, that's fun. Well, anyway, uh, I, Agree completely with Mike that if they can do it, if they do do it, they're usually pretty good people. What is that? Oh, is it a crystal ball? Thank you. It's made out of plastic. There's 795 from the NGH. Um, and whether or not you can hypnotize somebody with this, I honestly don't know. You can um, catch their attention. Well, I've known old time hypnotists who will sit in a bus station or something kind of going like that. Oh, that's that. I'm like, what did you ask? <laughs> <laughs> well, I keep it around the office. I don't use it that much. But getting more clinical. Oh, man. Yeah, oh. Jerry. Yeah. yeah. Jerry. He, uh, where is he, Florida? Yeah. yeah. Here's some more medical toys. Well, this may not show up too well on the camera. It is a flame. And a flame is what you use if you want to bleed a patient to let the bad spirits out. That's the other way you can disattach. <laughs> so you take this thing and you squeeze it. And those of you are out front, uh, a little knife blade comes flying out of it. If you happen to have a patient in a good spot, you can just shoot it right into the uh, yeah. oh, median vein in the antecubital fossa. Is that how you wake them up? <laughs> <laughs> Don't wake them up. Yeah. Uh, they'll bleed well. 
<laughs> under no circumstances do that. You're violating the medical practice. And even if you're a doctor, it's not a smart thing to do. They did this with George Washington. But uh, Freud knew that uh, people could go into a dissociative state by staring at the bright, shiny objects. And he had either this or a lancet case or something about this small and shiny. And once again, he just hold it up above eye level and ask them to stare at it. And their eyes begin to get tired and just let the others. Well, I'm not going to go to the floor, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's a fun little gadget to have around as an example of what we did 100 years ago in hypnosis. Wow. When I was working in a hospital for 12 long years, my office was across the hall from surgery, and I had great connections with them. Could roll in any old time I wanted to. And things showed up from time to time. We were doing an autopsy one time, and this showed up. This is a uh, pacemaker. In fact, it's um, on the Stanacar demand pacemaker. They let you take that out. We took it out of a cadaver. No, no. Oh, <laughs> we took it out of a cadaver. I mean, it was a, a uh, pathologist who had an office across the hall from me. He was a great guy. And he came in, he says, Hey, you want to see a post? Uh -huh. um, uh, uh, you, uh, you mean a fence post, sir? <laughs> <laughs> you like to go to the autopsies, don't you? Oh, yeah, I love to go to the autopsies. Well, we got a dad. He was 48 years old, drank himself to death. Wait till you see her. <laughs> so this is 20 years ago, 23 years ago. So we, we go down the board and she's lying there on a steel table. And uh, he had done 10,000 autopsies on this time, so he was pretty fast. And he just cut her open, put in a spreader, opened up her ribs, and <laughs> reached in. And this thing was sitting there. And you think, uh, yeah, a couple little wires came out, just sitting in yeah, her chest. You know? yeah. Now, of course, they put them in pockets and stuff. 23 years ago. And the thing was, it looked really shiny and clean, and, and uh, usually they get kind of dummy. And uh, and I said, gosh, how long has that been in there? He said, six hours. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, some heroic cardiovascular surgeon felt that it might help. Uh -huh. This is a gal who came in uh, essentially vomiting blood. And uh, among other things, she had lower esophageal varices because she had a cirrhotic liver. And, and she was so sick that this probably didn't do her any good at all, but some insurance company paid about five grand for that. And he was a kindly old pathologist. He knew I like to play with instrumentation. He says, yeah, if you like that, you can have it. And he added, don't let it go down to Mexico. They reuse them down there. Yeah. Now, again, it was <laughs> 25 years ago. And I said, oh, that boy. And I took it home, put it on in the subscope. You just change the resistance between the electrodes and it starts beating. It's got batteries in it. Well, what do you do? If you can find one of these, and you can, you can get them online. People sell used pacemakers online just as artifacts. And you can show this to a smoker and say, look, if you keep that up, it's highly likely that one of these is waiting for you in an emergency room. And it ain't going to cost your insurance company five grand it's probably ten now now in the event that you drink too much we have <laughs> i showed you this didn't i and i express i explained that this is not a sex toy i mean i know it looks a little bit uh, but it's not it's a lower esophageal it's online too <laughs> but they sell yeah the same yeah, now that one is five thousand dollars. This one is um, what Wilson Cook in Chicago. Yeah, um, it's really it. You can bend it, but you can't pinch it. It has interesting dimensional signaling. And what you do is there's a special inserter. You can run it down the throat and let it sit right at the uh, lower esophageal junction. And for a patient that has lower esophageal varices, which are sort of hemorrhoids of the throat, except they're hemorrhoids or arteries. These are swollen veins down in the lower esophagus and they bleed. Um, you can put that in there, 
And then you can at least get fluid into the patient for another two or three weeks or until they die from the problem. Now this particular lady uh, had um, a cirrhotic liver. And I remember the doc, he, 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 if you haven't seen this, you just can't imagine how fast they could go for organs. You can just pull out organs very, very rapidly. He reached in, pulled out her liver, and said 3,900 grams. And we're down, we had masks on and all this stuff, and he put it on the meat scale, and it weighed maybe 3,940 grams. I thought, oh, he must have done a lot of autopsies. And he said, here, and honest, he, he threw it at me, but he was nice. He was kind of an underhand, he just tossed the liver to me. And I caught it, you know, I wanted to act you know, non pulse you know. <laughs> Yeah, we catch livers every day around here, don't we, Bob? And uh, he said, what do you think of that? And I said, um, well, it feels like a sack of sand. He said, you bet it does. That's classic micronodular cirrhosis. This lady drank herself to death. She drank and she like, she really set herself up for just destruction in her life. Too bad a really hypnotist didn't get to her in time to cut out those bad habits. For people who still have the bad habits, you can say, well, if uh, where is it? Yeah. If you smoke too much, one of these is waiting for you, and if you drink too much, one of these is waiting for you. And in either case, it's going to be quite unpleasant. And one of the things that happens in our society is that people take very bad care of themselves and then expect the rest of us <coughs> to pay to fix them. Dr. Heller, you're raising your hand. Simple, simple question. Yeah. So clearly you took about aversion therapy for these techniques, and I like to use a lot of aversion therapy to you know, have habits that are harmful to their health. And so when you're doing part of your pre-talk, do you bring these things out, or do you bring them out in the hypnotic state? No, nope. no, no. Oh, oh, oh. That really is. I mean, if, if, if there, if there's the there some endless, and mm -hmm. you bring out something threatening like that, right? You don't. You're, you're taking. I mean, you know not to. I've never done that. I do it in a pre talk. So I do it in a pre talk. I'm successful because I'm a legend of my own. Then the post talk. Okay. The post talk is the manners jar talk, see? I had a gal, I guess I could sit down. Yeah, you can get me sitting down. <laughs> but when I lectured at the NGA shop in New England every summer, I would go down to the airport and run around for an aircraft and get my shoes shot. And there was a gal that shined shoes, shown shoes, whatever she did, uh, she'd be down and just banging away on the shoes. And I noticed she had a pack of Marlboros in her pocket, or in her jacket. And uh, the, as, as she's down there banging away on my shoes, I noticed that she's got Marlboros in her pocket. And I'm thinking, that's crazy. You know, you shouldn't do that. You're only 35 years old. And I reached forward and tapped on that pack. Not the brightest thing to do. <laughs> I mean, it's sitting right in front of her left breast. I, I suppose I could have been a little less. Can you talk about shocking people? And I, I just, I didn't touch the pack. I didn't grope the poor girl. And I said, you smoke? She you yeah. had your shorts attached. She had them. Was I carrying a firearm? You can't, damn. Anyway, she, uh, she said, yeah, and I hate it. So. Well, I'm a hypnotist, and I teach hypnosis nationwide. I'm going to come back in about a week. Here's my card. Come to see me. She went through, in her case, she had a pretty heavy headache. And we did do six sessions. But boy, she quit. She really quit. And that third, well, fifth or sixth session, I uh, said, you know, cigarettes are quite expensive. In those days, it was $5 a pack. If you're smoking a pack a day, you're throwing away a $5 debt bill every day, aren't you? Why don't you get yourself a manager? And every day, put a $5 bill into the jar. And after a few weeks, you'll be surprised. <clears throat> you know, how much it adds up to. How much is going up in smoke. And by the way, 
you take the mayonnaise out first. <laughs> she know that. I mean, wouldn't she know that? I mean, she's stupid enough to smoke. You know, so anyway, I've done this many times. This, this is a beat up old mayonnaise here. Oh, this is, I've kept her around the office for years. And uh, so three months later, she called and goes, Dr. Beebe, uh, I'm not smoking. I'm so glad. I really, oh, I feel so much better. I'm not, but I have a jar full of flies. What do I do with them? And I was deeply inclined to say, you must bring them to me now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did my command. Yeah, I thought that might, yeah, well. She says, well, I don't want to do that. I said, no, you don't have to do that. Get yourself a pair of Tony Lama boots. Get yourself a new Stetson. Get one of those jackets you wear with a fringe on. You cowgirls, you know, whenever you wear those boots, that jacket, that hat, realize that that used to go up in smoke, and now you're free of that. Now, I am not really certain whether collecting letters from your clients, it, it's a good thing to take them away because you don't want this stuff in their hands. And they, they, they're so used to hanging on, it's like hanging on to a Xanax bottle, but it's a different thing. Um, and uh, but <laughs> I had a cop one time who looked at the big basket and stuff like that. And it's just full of dicks. He says, "You realize you have a, a, a certifiable fire hazard or something in your office?" <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the reason I pointed out this book, and I would, would say to you, if you can obtain it online or in a used bookstore for five or ten bucks, you might find it interesting to read through. This is uh, good a reference for uh, <coughs> eyeball as anything I know of. It's called Trance and Treatment and it's by Spiegel and Spiegel, both MDs, father and son. It happens that his daughter, who is his sister, uh, was my girlfriend in 70. No. <laughs> she was a second year pediatric resident at a facility in Tucson called TMC. Stands for too much confusion. Um, a brilliant young lady who did not go into the family psychiatry business. Uh, she is a pediatrician. I learned a lot about hypnosis from this gal who was the daughter of one of the top psychiatric just in the country. I feel very sorry for people who smoke and I want to help them but I don't give the time away. And then, yeah, and I teach it now since I'm certified to do it for 15, 20 years now. I enjoy doing it. And I encounter people who say, well, I like hypnotizing people and I just don't think I should charge more than you know, maybe 40 or 50 bucks an hour. I mean, it's just talk. It isn't just talk. And we all know that. And particularly in the case of stopping smoking, you are saving someone a hundred thousand dollars. You may well save them a quarter of a million. And I've been working, and I just don't know enough lawyers to be kind of neat. Well, you're, like, maybe we could do this, Lou. Uh, we, if we could write up a contract that when you take someone off smoking, they send you half of what they would have spent on cigarettes for the rest of their life. After all, yeah. it's saving them a fortune. So. There's nothing wrong in charging a reasonable professional fee for doing it. I don't like this. The man I am replacing tonight, the incredible Don Rice. Uh, gee, 300 an hour, right? Or did it go up beyond that? He was darn well worth it. And he would stop people in smoking, sometimes stop a smoker in 45 minutes. I don't recommend that either. Uh, Hypnosis works by repetition and reinforcement. So doing multiple sessions is really helpful. And if you go. The, well, okay. the trans and treatment that you buy online is an e-book for about 60, depends who you get, 60, 70 bucks. Oh. So just, just yeah, that's, <laughs> you get a, essentially a new order. Well, you, you get a read. Yeah. You, you get it in a yeah. question now. about, so you, I'll just start to talk about it though. Right, you know, be gentle with how you deal with it. So I have a couple of different philosophies 
So yeah, I'm, I'm not, not recommending this. I'm saying it is yeah, the information. Yeah. Right. Um, if you have the two pack they smoke, <laughs> right? There's a time. Is it? I've taken down the one pack, then they have to pack them off, rather than cold turkey. I've also done the cold turkey. And Which works better? You do more than I do. Uh, no, you thought way more than that. <laughs> but, but this way. Here's, here's what here's here's you what I do. Them. Here, here's what yeah. I do. Here's what I do. I I give them the choice. Mm -hmm. So which do you think would be preferable for you? And then they're telling me what they want to do, and that yes. tends to be the more successful way. I found if you believe them, either way will work. I had it with both ways. So I think it's not realistic. I, I learned originally to go cold turkey, and I've been very successful with that. I kind of modified that. Because if you have a failure, then you have to deal with that failure. But it's their failure. Of course. <laughs> yeah, no. Dr. Heller, Kate stopped me from smoking. I was a smoker for 35 years, three pack a day. Right. I could go to the bathroom without a cigarette in my mouth. Right. I visited her in Chicago. She gave me a relaxation. I was still smoking when she woke me up. But she gave me a letter before I got on the plane for Phoenix again. And she said, don't open it until I give you a call on. Um, January 3rd, she called me and says, you know what Dan was saying, Kate? I looked at that cigarette in the morning, and I knew it was just something I couldn't do again. But it was mm -hmm. one relaxation. I don't know what she did to but I was hard. No, I, I, I had hardcore one session done. Mm -hmm. I have had that. Oh, okay. But, yeah. uh, but it doesn't always work. You know what Don Martin says about this? He, he, he does an immense amount of Midwest, now he's down in Florida. Uh, he'll do a single session, you know, but he'll say to them, you're going to find it, that you will sometimes have reminders of the habit, not cravings. <laughs> we don't want to tell them they're having cravings. You may have an occasional reminder of the habit. And some people have quite a few reminders and it may take a few more sessions to really seal this or settle it. But you've done so well that we're proud of the way you're going and recognize that uh, as the reminders come up, you can set them aside. Another thing he does, it's classic, I think we've been through the red. Uh, he uses a post-it knife that's called Martin's Red. How many of you have done red, R-E-D? It's, uh, looking at uh, Ellen. I was teaching Ellen that the other day, and she, uh, this is a gal who's a psychiatric nurse practitioner with an immense amount of knowledge. And she said, well, I've never seen it before. And I went, well, it's kind of proprietary to Don Martin and the NGH, but it's a big deal because it works very well. And then she reviewed the materials and everything, and she sent me a note, and she said, well, do you always just use it for habit cessation, or uh, could you use it for implanting other things and stuff? Well, you probably could use it for almost anything, but the secret of the little, uh, it's a, a post-hypnotic that fits on one page, is that red means stop, and normally we aren't trying to start a habit. Now you could, you could start someone on a habit of drinking eight glasses of fresh, cool, clear, delicious water each day, help them release weight and so forth, but generally we are stopping habits. And so what you do is simply tell them that following this session, you will find that the color red is sharper and brighter and more intense to you than ever before. Could be the color of a car. Could be a lady's nail polish. Could be as, as big as a, bowl, a bulletin board or as small as a little hat pin, but that color red, 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 will seem brighter, sharper, more intense to you than ever before. Every time you encounter the color red, Consciously or subconsciously. Your desire, your determination to stop smoking now for good becomes more and more powerful for you. Now you don't need to look for the color red, you'll notice it automatically. It'll be bright and sharp and clear to you. And each time you see the color red, 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 it reminds you you stopped smoking now. Now in the case of obesity, She's rampant. Some of us even have a touch in it. Uh, you really don't want to stop them from eating. So you use red to remind them to 
Stop overeating. That's okay. And what provoked my question is you said you did. You are so much frequently for low carb You said four or five or six sessions. Yes. I'm not done with them in three. Mm -hmm. um, something else is going on. <coughs> yeah, so that's why I asked you if you taper, because why would you take. Yep. Unless you were having trouble with their feeling of. Um, I don't, yeah, see, I, I, don't tape, so many I don't tape them on purpose. I don't tell them, well, uh, we're just going to get you down to two packs a day, and then we're going to take you down to a pack and a half, and well, pretty soon we'll be one, one pack. Look, a pack of cigarettes is 20 of them. Each one is about eight bucks. 20 times eight is 160. So if the patient says to you, I just do one pack a day, this is it's just one bad thing I do myself each day, one pack. That one pack is 160 bad things you do each day. So, and I, I see your point exactly. But, <coughs> but I let them, if, if the, pain, hey, the tapering occurs, it's because they come back and say, oh boy, I knew I shouldn't, but I, I just had to have a couple of cigarettes on Sunday. Good, how many were you having before? Oh. Two packs a day. Well, no, that's quite an improvement, isn't it? Why don't we see if we can do a little better than that? <coughs> Are your initial intention is to do it more? <coughs> no, because the other thing is, simplistically, having done this for 20 years, 25, hypnosis works by repetition and reinforcement. So the more suggestions you can get into their head, so to speak, uh, the greater effect you probably have. Uh, and again, it's it's a terrible habit. It killed my parents and my sister, and I don't know any of the others that are horrible about it. And most people just sort of think, well, it's not so bad. If it was bad, the government wouldn't let us do it. Because we know how careful the government is with our health. So, I, you know, I've had people put in one session. I've had some that come back for six, and they do marvelously well. But if they're two-hour sessions and 150 an hour, they end up saying, what, 1800 dollars but compared to a smoking habit that's costing twenty five hundred a year, I just want for everyone in the room who's yeah. doing this because I've had twenty years experience also. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll get the one and done like, like oh yes, but you know, many times you have to be persistent and you don't want to say at the end of one or two sessions why well, this class. I guess this is going to work for me, yeah. and and that's why when people in the room do know sometimes it does take four or five or six sessions. That that was my mm -hmm. yes exactly, and I I'm. And then, of course, do more sessions, you make more money. But on the other hand, <laughs> you could see more clients if you did more people instead of more sessions. For uh, other questions. I hope, hope you've enjoyed seeing some of my toys. Hope you enjoyed reading the uh, yeah. papers. Sam, what's that? One question. So, a potential client calls you on the phone. So I smoke a pack and a half a day. Can you help me? What? Well, of course, you answer. Yeah, it's good to see. But I mean, what do you do on the phone? Do you do a little intake? Do you do a little uh, exploratory session about their motivation? I'm not ignoring you, Sam. I'm trying to find room on the board. I'll bet you none of us have learning goals of the day, do we? <laughs> I'll bet you know the really might if you get better. If you can't see this, be sure and tell me that.
It is amazing what Ed Tishy does. Uh, and it's easy to remember. When, when you say that to a, a new client, uh, a part of them takes a deep breath and kind of sighs and thinks, oh, finally I found the answer. No, maybe they haven't. But at least you're setting them up. Now, you can say it on the phone. I'm so glad you're calling. I know that I can help you. Would Tuesday afternoon or Tuesday morning do that? Matt, when do you think you can come in? So you know, the score. The nature of the hat yeah. on the phone. It depends. Some of them. In these papers, yeah, some people just explode at the call. The minute they've got you, they want to tell you, you know, the story and everything is wrong. You all notice that kind of thing. And you really don't want to cut them off. That's a little bit cruel to just say, well, that's all well and good. Are you going to come and spend money in my office or not? I mean, you don't do that. But, um, Something along that line. And then many of them say, well, great. And, and you can even quote fees, you can quote time of days. And what I do is go through location. I tell them exactly how to get to the office. Uh, even though they've been driving around Tucson for a long time. <coughs> and I get a little bit of feedback. You know where that is. Can you find me? Yeah, fine. And pretty soon, uh, you'll also hear them say things like, uh huh, yeah, okay. That's great, I'll do it. No. If you, whatever you call for a fee, they instantaneously say, I can't afford that. And you have to decide whether you're going to be a really kind person taking care of pro bono cigarette smokers who they have harmed themselves, or whether you just plain got to put your foot down and say, oh, I'm a professional, my time uh, takes 60 minutes an hour and everybody else's. And, uh, so, I, in answer to your question, I, I say the most encouraging thing I can on the phone. And I let them explain a little bit, but I realize that their time is only one and mine is incomprehensible. So, does that answer the question? Yes. Others, everybody <coughs> think I'm full of here, go, Debbie. Do you ever take payment plan, especially for some that have a like that? Uh, hey, can you send five bucks? a day and give it to me. <laughs> you know how hard that would be? You know, after a week or two. Yeah, after a week or two, they are oh, I'm fixed for you. That's a technical term I use um, <laughs> that um, No, I, you know, if you were, you know, one of the easiest things is to use plastic. Let them pay the yeah. credit card company back. Um, it's very helpful to do that, but five a day or even 50 a month, <laughs> you know, it's just probably irrational data. The fee is part of the cure. Uh, Dr. Manager, we hear from Dr. Manager in the back. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Manager pointed out when the people complained that the fee was unbelievably outrageous. It is part of the cure. Sometimes it's my needs to know that what we are doing is valuable. We're not playing a game. <laughs> so, yeah, the fee is, but on the other hand, an infinite fee without being valuable or effective. This has been fun, and you've just been a wonderful group. I hope I've reached that. You notice I've emphasized smoking. Because frankly, that's where the money is. If you want to take people off of eating too much, you're facing a particularly difficult thing because we do have to eat. And the best you can do is get them to stop overeating. And the ones that do it are fabulous. They're just amazing. I can't tell you what you do. But there are others that go, I just can't seem to lose any weight. I don't care what you say to me. Well, um, what would Martin say? He started off by saying, are you enthusiastic about this? Are you certain you want to release weight from that body of yours? Are you positive? You know, and he just builds and builds and builds and gets them. Say, so, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. It's so, uh, Carney. So said, get them saying yes, yes, right away. Well, fine. But in smoking, you're working with something that is poisonous, dangerous, irrational, <laughs> and still 
remarkably widespread. What is it, 25% of the yeah, 20, 20, 20, yeah, public? 20% 20 of 350 million people is a significant number, 70 million people. However, there are the difficult 70 million ones. The smarter smokers have already quit. That's why you tell them to take mayonnaise out first. <laughs> it is not only dangerous smartphone, it's incredibly <coughs> stupid. And they think they can do it, but you can. Even the three packs a day. Now, Kate is special. Kate does, works almost in the realm of miracles. And so you pick the right to Therapist. Luke. I know I need to spend a lot of your time, but just no. to the board. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with binge eating disorder? <laughs> yeah. In 2013, it became an official disorder. Up until then, it wasn't recognized. So the DSM 5, uh, 6, 10. Good God. God. Yeah, five. Five. Yes, five. Yes, five. Yes, five. Yes, five. Yes, five. Yes, five. Good God. It is now the most common eating disorder. I'm people identify in this country. And the interesting thing is, I had three people coming uh, in one week to have a digital disorder. And then I saw the, the TV commercials. Yeah. 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 And I saw them out of And then I, you know, I wasn't even aware that was happening. The commercials are driving people to want to call us. Yes, yes. But it's, yeah. it's, it's a psychiatric malady. It is a psychiatric malady. Simple overeating. And uh, you have the convenience of being in the biggest healthcare union in the world. Uh, for hypnotists who don't have uh, a degree in medicine or some other credentialing that the state recognizes, if you put an ad in the paper saying you treat binge eating disorder, you may be stepping on the medical practice act pretty bad. You won't do that. Now, I, I think I would refer them out. I really do. I have the Fabulous thing, I refer people to you, and I have a shrink in that office. Um, I send you people and they disappear into a little black hole. <laughs> <laughs> can we go to you? No, we can. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I agree, there's a need there, and there are people who specialize in the field who are good at it, but as you work with them, you find it. Well, it's based on what David's uh, presentation is about. Mm -hmm. It's a deeper disorder, very deep disorder. And the binge eating is just a manifestation of the deep stuff going on underneath. Exactly. So I can with the stuff that David was talking about. That's where you're actually able to help. Yeah, I mean, it does take release much, which is, in my opinion, the unlikely of it. Yeah. I don't claim to be able to do it, but I suspect I can figure out how. You see so many people hurt so bad because of the things they do. We haven't begun to talk about uh, alcohol, and all I can say is that it's, it's awfully bad when you do sick. Uh, the lady I, who we got the patient here out of showed up at the emergency room at night with a uh, cop kind of helping her in the door. There was one over the inside of her car, especially on her steering wheel. And, um, I learned this in retrospect, but you think, God, what happened? Well, um, she had a cirrhotic liver, and so there was incredible back pressure in the veins in her lower esophagus, and they were breaking. And the stuff, the blood drains down into the stomach, but your stomach sees it as lipid. And so it takes a while to digest it. It, it, it builds up. And then if you do vomit, you throw blood all over whatever's in front of you. And even then, there was something about, well, how come you didn't come in immediately? And she apparently said, oh, it stopped. <laughs> yeah. So people don't take very good care of themselves. And uh, if we can do what we can, it's compassionate and all that, but you can't be a compassionate <laughs> veterinarian. That's a doc who spends $280 million on $280,000 building his office and putting in all kinds of extra equipment and then taking his three hats. Um, you won't ever pay off here. Thank you, Kate.